Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Winner's Circle. Today, my guest is Cassandra Lane, who is the editor-in-chief of LA Parent Magazine, but also she is the author of this extraordinary, moving, heartfelt book called We Are Bridgers. It's a memoir. Please say hello to Cassandra Lane. Thanks for joining us, Cassandra. Hi, Margo. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, Cassandra, I wanted you to join us today because, first of all, this book, We Are Bridges, I can't think of the last time I was this deeply moved by a book. I read the whole thing in two days. It was glorious. But um, <clears throat> you have also been an editor um, at LA Parent Magazine, and I wanted to discuss how you got this book done because you're a full-time mom <laughs> and you know a full-time working editor, and you got a book that is you know, not a light book. This is an extraordinary book. Talk, talk to us. How did you structure your life? When did you decide you wanted to write a book? And how did you structure your personal and professional life to get this done? Excellent. Yeah, it's been a long, long journey. And uh, the book is actually a project that I started when I first left Louisiana and moved to Los Angeles. It was my thesis for, or the bones of it was my, were my thesis, um, for my MFA program. And that was in 2001 through 2003. Oh, wow. Yeah, when I first started, those uh -huh. really skeletal though. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I started working full-time again after graduating. Uh, I had my son in 2000, oh, I got pregnant in 2006, had him in 2007, um, and would just kind of poke at the book a little bit here and there. You know how it is as a mom mm -hmm. of, a, of a baby and then toddler. Mm -hmm. and, so I really, I would say it was just really little tidbits, sometimes just a journal entry, um, just little bit by bit by bit. And then as he got older, I started, you know, becoming more serious about really finishing the book. And I had to start getting up at, setting my clock to get up at 4, 4.30 in the morning. <gasps> Yeah, four, four thirty. All right. I started feeling around twenty fifteen through seventeen. I really felt like I had a pretty good structure with the book, and um, and then in twenty nineteen, it was so close. I sent it off uh, to a contest that it was a runner up for in early twenty nineteen, and that that just really affirmed for me that I was going in the right direction. And yeah, I just at, by that point, I was in that system of getting up at four, four thirty in the morning, which I have to do in order to have my own time before it's time to get my kid up to get ready for school. Right. To get myself ready for work. So right. that's how I really finally finished it was just by being up with the birds. Wow. 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 I love the birds. I love the coffee. OK, so how many I try to be very practical here so everybody can really understand because when you said you're getting up with the birds, first, I do want to say this was a multi-year focus for you, multi right? Yeah, multi-year. Yes. I love that it was your thesis in your MFA, which is a big degree, right? Mm -hmm. That degree alone takes, yeah, what did you, yeah, what is it, that two-year degree? It was a two-year one for me. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Um, and a commitment and an investment, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. A big investment. Very expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. That's not like a small degree. That's yeah. a big freaking extra mm -hmm. on top specialty mm -hmm. degree that you had to like uh, what did you think when you were getting your mfa what were you your first goal doing your mfa what were you going to use that for like why did you say i'm going to get an mfa oh yeah master's, so really master's of fine arts mm -hmm. i have to define that for it's a master's of fine arts right and you're mm -hmm. it's usually writing focused for some people absolutely right? so okay. mine was master of fine arts in creative writing with a. Uh, with a specification in creative nonfiction. So I had been a newspaper journalist since graduating from college, from undergrad. I was uh, editor in chief of my campus newspaper as you know, 19, 20, 20 oh, probably 20, 21 year old. Then I worked for the local newspapers and intern. They hired me after I graduated. And although I loved newspaper writing and I actually love that it gave me such great training and research and interviewing and meeting all these people, working with editors, mm -hmm. um, my dream was always to write books. So that was my quote unquote safe, you know, put the bread on the table job. Uh -huh. um, so I decided after almost 10 years of working as a newspaper reporter that I would do the MFA program to have that chance to concentrate for two years on my work. 
on my creative project. I was, I, what I wanted was to have the time to concentrate, have the time to write, have the time to really read and read deeply and to mm -hmm. work with mentors and other students who were there just for creative writing. You know, when you're an undergrad, people are doing everything. So right. the MFA program, we're all there on one accord. <laughs> um, and those, and it's so, it's so special because I still, that was 20 years ago and I still have wonderful friendships that dated, you know, back then, because we're still all many of us working on on those dreams still. So that's what that's what I wanted. I wanted that time. I wanted that focus, that structure, the learning, the camaraderie, and I got mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah, it was, it was hard. Hard. a lot of right. work. Yeah, and so that was your germ, right? and then you started, and then you're like more into that 2014, 2015. When you're saying up with the birds and you have a full-time job at that point. You were a teacher at some point, right? In there, or were you at a magazine? How many times a day were you getting up at 4.30? How long of this process? How much did you write each time? Talk to us about your process and how you were getting this done. Yeah, so I've always had very demanding jobs and I've gotten to know the city by working in a few different, probably six or seven uh, careers, all tied to writing in some way. But I've worked for the Dodgers as the community relations manager. I've worked for an education nonprofit downtown as a senior writer. So very, very demanding jobs. Um, I would say, I think when I really found my groove, I was getting up I would, at least six days a week. Um, <gasps> wow. Yes. And and how much time were you putting? Six days a week, how much time were you putting in? Was that an hour, giving yourself an hour, hour and a half, two hours? What it's were you doing? About, about an hour and a half to two hours. Wow. Um, not, not all of that was writing. It takes me a while. I had to kind of set my ritual. I have my own, you know, this is my studio that you see here. Mm -hmm. At one point I was in the main house. So I had a little writing room in there. Um, but just setting the stage, lighting candles and incense and making my tea, making it really warm, thinking back to what I wrote the yeah. day before, you know, doing a little research, some journaling. It takes me a while. To, I'm a very, very slow writer um, and it takes me a while to get started. But so those those two hours were part ritual, part research, part thinking and reflecting and meditating and Maybe I love years. it. I Maybe love that you years. included that in there. The ritual. No, it's so true yeah. to get yourself. It's almost like your channel. One of my favorite things that I ever heard anybody say. And in this moment, I was like, oh, and it was Stephen King in his book on writing. And he somebody said, what is writing? And he said, telepathy. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, my God, that's it. That's why you need to put yourself in. And I got it. I got everything from your book. Like I was like, oh my God, I felt every turn. And you, woman, take some demanding jobs. You are not a woman who coasts on your jobs. Man, you were like, easy job. You, no, you never took an easy job. And then you gave yourself a hard job on top of that. Um, but yeah, I think getting yourself into the place where you can be that conduit for the writing and make sure that it's coming from a good place. And sometimes it's an angry place. I've had it come from every emotion. Yeah. So yeah. this book is really about a journey of healing. Mm -hmm. It is so stunning. I, you know, I, every woman I would recommend to it. Woman, every mother, anybody who wants to be a mother, any person of it's definitely written from your African American perspective mm -hmm. from that trauma. But I think every woman of any color can, you know, many different cultures have trauma in yes. their history. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's such a stunning book of reflection of where mm -hmm. you came from. Do you feel that you've healed in some way from writing this book? Yes, parts of me have definitely healed, um, or at least they're further along than they were. I think I'm now at this age, at 50, um, of, the, of the belief that there are some wounds that can never be completely healed, and that mm -hmm. the healing part is to accept that. Um, That's sweet. That the, heal the, the healing is in sharing and examining it and you know, putting some balm on it, um, caring for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, there's certainly some wounds that can be, but when we're talking about multi-generational traumas, um, those are really hard things to reckon with. And, and you know, I think, though, that if we put the work into healing or trying to heal, that eventually throughout the generations that there can be full healing. Um, but I also do believe, 
yeah, yeah the, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna I say think, my I, I feel very free and liberated in the knowledge that it's okay to 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 accept it as an ongoing process. I also think that um speaking of it heals enormously. Like I think yeah. um shame and blame go so hand in hand together, and that when you're quiet about it, I personally believe when you speak it and say it, it takes so much of the onus and the pain out of it. Yeah. And the yeah. true shame is from not speaking. Absolutely. And, and other people do that to you. Like, shh, don't tell. Don't Absolutely. say anything. Don't bring that up. And that's where I think culturally for so many people, um, it's very challenging. And this is a book, I, again, I'm, I'm, I loved it so much. It, it, is, it hauntingly stays with you. Um, it's about the lynching, uh, the original pain that you're tracing is of your great grandfather, great grandfather, great great grandfather, year without my great grandfather, mm -hmm. and through the generations and oh, the way you languished, mm -hmm. the pain that is often through generations that does not get to be expressed and then is transferred on to another generation. Well, probably one of the most poignant examples of it I ever read in my life. Oh, thank you so much, Marco. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. it. It's, it's splendid. How did your family react to this book? I would say mixed. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a high, you know, the book came out in April. So I was on a high with all the book launch stuff. And I got some really beautiful um, emails and notes from family. So that lasted about two weeks before that hit the wall. And I got a very angry um, response. Yeah, or at course. least it came through my mom because uh, a relative was very upset about what really amounts to about three sentences in the book um, yeah. where I mentioned that there had been a pattern of incense, incest. Yeah. Um, it's very yeah. generic. It's synonymous. There are no names, but that really set off um, and triggered uh, a few people in the family. So, so definitely and, uh, highs and lows. Yeah. Yeah, there's an old Annie Lamont, you know, if you wanted me to write better, you should have acted better. Or, yeah. you know, something like if you wanted me to write better about you, you should have acted better. But I yeah. do believe, and especially women, I think women, especially mothers, are given so much pain to almost shut up about. Oh. And that's what I think you just did such a stunning example of, of showing what yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. um, and. What part of this book was the hardest to write, Cassandra? You know, I think uh, writing about my, I didn't want to write a book that just pointed the fingers outward to whether it was society or family, whatever. I really wanted to look at my own, you know, failures and my own trials and tribulations and, and shortcomings. And so there was a lot of, you know, it wasn't so hard to write it. Um, but the fear of sharing that, the fear of like bearing my soul and, you know, things that I'd done to mess up my first marriage and outbursts that I'd had that were, you know, were embarrassing. There was a lot of shame around that. Um, and so, yeah, there were, there were lots of moments of complete breakdowns um, and shame and regret. Uh, but all of that was part of the, the healing process so that by the time it did hit the shelves and <laughs> digital and physical shelves, I'd really done, dealt with a lot. Of course, there's certain things that you regret in your past and always will, but I didn't have the, I wasn't carrying that shame, but it took a while to get there. And I think that's part of probably why it took so long too, in addition to not having much time, but I was also just like fearfully hanging on to the pages and afraid to let my part of the story out there. I get it. I totally understand it. And I do want to say you did such a brave and stunning work with it that I think it frees many people as they read it. You mentioned that you, one part of your path was entering a contest with the book. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big believer, you know, as a publicist and a writer, I have found surprisingly that contests have a great purpose. Uh, sometimes it just, you win or you don't win. Uh, somebody once said to me, the only writer who doesn't have an award is somebody who hasn't entered stuff enough. Uh, did Talk about the contest and how it might have motivated you or changed you or on your path, because that is a winning technique. That Yeah, absolutely. There are so many paths to, to writing, as you know. I mean, 
Some people have an agent, some people self-publish, some people enter contests. Um, and so I didn't have an agent. I was, I love the revision process. I was on, I don't know what number, you know, of revising. I revised in kind of a cyclical, circular way. So, you know, it wasn't the whole book, but I revised certain sections. Um, and I, I was feeling good about it. And I found out about this contest. I sent it off forgot about it and heard back from them that, you know, they, the judge really liked the book and wanted to be in touch. Um, and we've become friends. We've never met, but we've become friends because she was just, she loved the book structurally. She didn't, she think she thought I needed to continue working on it, which I did. Um, and the contest, this particular contest wanted books to be as close to publishing as possible. Um, so there wasn't going to be a lot of developmental editing. So she said, well, here are my notes. And she's a professor, so she brought that and she's a, a novelist herself. Um, so it was just invaluable feedback and support that encouraged me to keep going. And then I entered another contest that same year, a little bit Good later. For you. Good and for you. That's, that's actually, and it won. So that's how oh, it published. Oh, it won. That's yeah. how it got published? With the, with the second contest. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> love it. I'd love to hear yeah. that. That's spectacular. And you're published by the name alone um it's the feminist press which the is press. oh my gosh that's that's where it belonged i don't know anything about this publishing group i didn't look anything up but i mean yes. this is a book for enlightened women women who have yes. done some work yes. or would like I to love, do some work i, I love mean that press and always have it's a storied press it's the oldest and longest running uh woman owned and woman founded press in the world oh wow um, and the award the name of the contest is the louise merriweather uh first book prize they actually are opening up april 1st for any writers out there who might be interested say the uh, name women, again the mary the, the louise merriweather first book prize from the press. Yeah. And that's how you got published. That's how I got because oh. it came with a cash award and publication. Um, oh and my gosh, that's amazing. the best win ever. Yeah, yeah, it was so ever. <laughs> okay, to anybody who's watching that, who, you know, you just made me rethink contests because sometimes I think I've had moments of things I want to turn in. I'm like, eh, yeah. you know, there's always a fee. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just well, put it in and forget it. Fee. That was the beautiful thing about this too, that there is no fee. Oh, they that's really, really amazing. Yeah. That's unusual. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And then you wound up published and look where we are today. And it's yeah. just glorious. And I saw a rave review from the Kirkus Reviews, which is mm -hmm. like a really big deal. Yeah. What has come uh, to you from this book? Like, what are some of the triumphs that you just never expected writing a book? Oh, the NPR review was amazing to get that in the uh, first few weeks. And it was a, a very comprehensive and glowing, beautiful review. And then it was chosen as one of NPR's um, 2021 books. Um, my creme de la creme for me in terms of, um, you know, book events was the American and in, in, being at the American Library in Paris. Um, that was, I watched you there. I was so, ago. yeah. So it was a, hy a hybrid event. Most of the book events last year were virtual and they were beautiful. I really loved all of them. I loved the people that um, interviewed me for each event, but it was so nice to be in person and to be in Paris. Um, mm -hmm. And then just readers, you know, readers that I don't know. It's one thing to have friends and family, but readers that I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's who I wrote the book for and to get their messages and to see their posts. Um, that for me is everything. That is fantastic. Um, Cassandra, what part of the book did you, like, how'd you get over some of the writing hurdles? What'd you do when you were like, I don't want to finish this. I can't finish this. I'm tired. How'd you yeah. get over the hurdles? My, you know, I have so many journals. I have um, kind of almost, I'm not this organized, but <laughs> a journal for every period of writing, I would say. Um, and so, you know, when I'm feeling, when I was feeling down or discouraged or doubtful, I would write about, about that doubt. I would also write about, you know, what the, what the problem was that I was having, what narrative problem I was having. Sometimes I would write a letter to, to a character. Um, and those, th as you're writing, like I remember right, I have one journal, it's just letters to Mary, my great grandmother, who was Aww. my great grandfather's love. Um, and so it was just, let, and it was just something so intimate and just precious and private about 
writing to her and she was long gone of course but mm -hmm. writing to her you know in that way on uh, second person that carried carried over into the book writing the book and i think even though i changed that to you know first person um that it continued to have some of that intimacy from the mm -hmm. letter writing so little mm -hmm. tricks like that you know reading while i was reading i'd be taking notes thinking about my own book mm -hmm. um, studying writing for those two years, you know, being in workshops that came out as a result of that MFA program, because we've stayed, so many of us have stayed in touch, you know, getting together, whether it was once every week, once a month, I've been in different workshops along the way. And that's, all of that's helped me. Um, mm -hmm. Doing readings, you know, reading from, you know, parts of the book over the years and having people respond um, helped me know that I needed to keep going. So That's fantastic. And I, I, I'm a big journaler too for work. I write everything down. Yeah. I journal a lot to work through. Um, also just to take note, more than a journaler, I'm a note taker. And yeah. I give that to anybody else as a success tip because I have a bunch of notes so that when I do go back to write, if I'm not in the mood, I still have a lot of notes to deal with. Absolutely. And I, I will tend to just, yeah. yeah. And I tend to just write my way through it instead of being there. And then that brings me to a question. How do you deal with writer's block? Do you have writer's block? How do you push through writer's block? Yeah, I absolutely do. One of the things that I like to, and I need to get back to this because I've fallen off the track. <laughs> One of the things that I encourage people to do is to keep a notebook by your bed. Um, uh -huh. And just write it when you wake up, you know, if you can remember your dreams, even if you can, I, just, I think there's something so sacred about that, um, the line between the sleep world and the awake world. And so to write down whatever images you can remember from your dreams, whatever thoughts first come to you, because you're going to forget them if you don't. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, there was such vivid, rich material from that just awake world that's still connected to, to the dream world that led to something later. So, that's yeah. fantastic. That's a great tip. And then lastly, this is such a loaded question, um, but because you do work as an editor, an executive editor-in-chief uh, at a parenting magazine, LA Parent, which I love and adore, and it's helped me find so many wonderful things. I'll give a shout out to LA Parent Magazine because they're you fabulous. And you're, great us, so I have. You. I've worked with them, and I love them, and you've been my editor, and I had never had a chance to really in-depth talk. And I do have to say that you know, when somebody I know writes a book, I read it, and oh my gosh, I just love this so much. I didn't expect to just sit down with it and just devour it. So, um, but this is a really loaded question, but we're both in the same genre of this. What tips for getting your private love done do you have for working moms? Because I also think it's so important for our children to yeah. watch us. If there's like a side hustle in your heart or something else you still want to do, I think it's really important for our children to okay. see us strive and get it done and fail and flounder, but go back. So um, in a last question, would you talk just, you know, the genre of working mom, talk about just how, what you've learned from working moms in getting that other project in your heart done. Mm, absolutely, Margot. That's such a, I mean, I feel so many emotions just from you, you know, asking that question. Um, joy over the things that I feel like I've done well, but teary over the things where I feel like, you know, moments where I feel like I've just completely failed my son. Um, I totally agree. And every mother feels that. <laughs> every mother feels that. Absolutely. Yeah. They do need to, yeah. They do need to see us, you know, not only working. I'm, I come, I'm the product of a, a single mom. Um, I was five when she divorced our dad and just saw her working and struggling. She's a gifted guitar, electric guitarist, but so much of her time was spent working. I was, as a child, cheering her on because I loved, I knew that, that brought her so much joy to, to play her guitar. But for years she would put it down because she was working so hard and dealing with heartbreak and all of those things. Um, but I think, you know, just the moments that I was able to see her on stage playing that, fed me and that helped me oh. you know, yeah, that absolutely helped me want to be an artist and want to pursue my own art my son now you know he's my biggest cheerleader he's an artist at heart too and so he'll go in his room and work on some beats or 
writing or whatever, it, painting, drawing. Um, so I think that it's very important. I agree that that we show our kids that, yes, we're juggling all these things, but I'm still going to carve out a special space for my mom's own special work. Yeah. Um, so again, for me, getting up super early for a, for a night owl that's going to be staying up super late. Um, just whatever you do, just making sure, even if it's not seven days a week, start with three days a week where it's your- I just want to let you know that I did write a book uh, and mine was two days a week. Two mine days. was Tuesdays and Thursdays for like a cool. year. And I thought, let me see how I do. Absolutely. That's what I could do. Yeah, and I focused on it, and then it becomes Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and that, you know, yes. you get to the end. But yeah, you got to get that. Yeah. You got to get that groove in for for yourself. It is Absolutely. Great. Well, Cassandra, I think one of the greatest things that anybody can do in life with another human being and even themselves is just to tell the truth and share the truth about your life. And I think you deserve an award. Um, you just deserve a great award for this book. Uh, my book is called "Where's My Award," and you deserve an award for telling. <laughs> The stunning truth and elegant way you did this in generational trauma, a woman's story of becoming a mother and yearning, and all the women in your family that came before you, you deserve an award for seriously telling the truth about yourself and life in a way that I think helps others flourish and, and just flower. And I hope you flower on because this is really a true work of art. Thank you so much, Margo. This was wonderful. Thank My you. pleasure. And if we are bridges more on. Thank you so much for joining us, Cassandra. It's been a treat. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>